Today, our visual paradigms are drastically changing. Our paranoia leads us to question even the construct of our visual realities. We've become to dismantle the linear perspective, the mathematics of art as put forth by Italian Renaissance painters and architects, no longer deals with the horizon or the vanishing point, but rather the detached observant gaze of God's eye view, the aerial view. The aerial view has become the new norm as technological tools of surveillance become seamlessly embedded within our contemporary landscapes. From the Orientalist depiction of the desert of 19th century aerial photography in the Middle East to the role that satellite imagery of the 1991 Gulf War has played in transforming war reportage, the problematic practices in landscape surveillance constitute the ways in which the technology of warfare perpetuates the military industrial complex that fits into the narrative of imperialism. The language of occupation and colonization has been written into the visualization of landscape. In 2013, Egypt made worldwide headlines for a story about a stork. It was caught and detained after a man spotted an electronic device attached to its back and accused it of espionage. The bird was suspected of being a spy, a Zionist spy, and was put in jail. Of course, once it was broadcast in the media, it became a spectacle that was in keeping with the absurdity of the events unfolding in Egypt. At this time, Egypt is in the middle of a grave crisis. The elected President Mohamed Morsi and senior figure of the Muslim Brotherhood was overthrown and jailed by the military in July 3, 2013. In the two months since Morsi was toppled, hundreds of his followers have been killed in clashes with army and police, including during an event that Human Rights Watch has called the most serious incident of mass unlawful killings in modern Egyptian history, where they state that at least 1,000 people were killed on August 14th. On Sunday, September 1st, 2013, Nature, Nature Conservation Egypt receives an email, quote, we have found out from the media that a white stork with our satellite tracking device was caught in Egypt near Inna and it is in captivity. Could you get in touch with the authorities and inform them that this is a stork from Hungary and the device is a wildlife tracking device we attach to, to it to follow the migration of the bird. Even you can find the details of the bird and the tracking data on our satellite tracking website. The stork was a native of Hungary and was following the Nile River on his migration toward the Lake Victoria Basin in eastern Africa when villagers in Inna in southern Egypt spotted him at rest with a white satellite tracker fixed to his back. He was one of 115 migrating birds being tracked by a consortium of European wildlife organizations. Inna, a small city in southern Egypt that has become a major traffic route between Upper Egypt and the Red Sea, Seemingly distant from the events unfolding around the country, the city has an interesting politi political history that includes an elaborate and complicated story of a secret military airbase. Here is an account from Larry Grinnell, technical communicator for the US military and taken from his personal website, quote, the first comm had an ongoing mission sending people to a classified location somewhere in the Middle East simply known to us as USAFE forwarding Operation Location Alpha, or simply Site Alpha. As it turns out, this was the forward base that launched the rescue attempt to bring back the American hostages in Iran, taken when the US Embassy was invaded in 1979. The rescue attempt, Operation Eagle Claw, failed completely due to many factors that are probably still being discussed today." End quote. As you might already know, the Iran hostage crisis was a diplomatic crisis in which 52 American diplomats and citizens were held hostage for 444 days from November 4, 1979 to January 20, 1980, after a group of Iranian students, supporters of the Iranian Revolution, took over the U.S. Embassy. Operation Eagle Claw, as Larry Grinnell mentioned, was an attempt to rescue the Americans held hostages, but failed miserably and damaged U.S. prestige worldwide in the process under President Jimmy Carter. The helicopters were sent from the military base in Inna, Egypt, and all encountered technical problems. Eight helicopters were sent. One encountered hydraulic problems. Another got caught in a cloud of fine sand. 
a third showed cracks in the rotor blade, and lastly, one of the helicopters crashed into a transport aircraft, killing eight servicemen and one Iranian citizen. Grinnell goes on to say, quote, no one was supposed to know where the base was until they were underway, unless they had the appropriate clearances and need to know. Gee, I thought, just having seen King Tut's riches, this was pretty amazing to be going to the country where he came from. We finally touched down after going around three times due to difficult weather at the site, and when I got to open the doorway, my heart sunk. There it was, miles and miles of miles and miles. This was a real desert with basically nothing. I quickly found out that Site Alpha was a former Soviet airbase, built in the days when the Soviets and the Egyptians were fast friends. Officially, it was known as Wedi Inna. We called it Bumfuck Egypt, BFE for short. Along with Tule Greenland and Minot, North Dakota, BFE was an often mythical place that military training instructors threatened to send you if you didn't get with the program. I think we even had a sign outside base operations that said, welcome to BFE. But when local Egyptian military folks and civilian dignitaries visited, the true meaning of BFE was masked with the acronym Beautiful Friendly Egypt. I don't think anyone was fooled, but I did at least try to play the game." End quote. The operation was eventually aborted and failed to save the hostages. The embassy hostages were then scattered around Iran to make another rescue attempt impossible. It seems bumfuck Egypt is not the luckiest of places. It is also where our spy stork friend faces his demise. A German engineer first attached a camera to a pigeon in 1908 to take aerial photographs. Dr. Julius Neubrunner patented the pigeon cam, a camera attached to a homing pigeon activated by a timing mechanism. Neubrunner was an apothecary in Kronberg, near Frankfurt, and he started receiving his pre prescriptions from a sanatorium in Falkenstein using pigeon post. He then thought, well, if a pigeon can carry drugs, surely it can carry a small camera. He fitted a light miniature camera with a harness weighing up to 75 grams, and the birds were already accustomed to carrying such weight. The Imperial Patent Office accepted his invention, which he titled, quote, method and device for photographing sections of terrain from the bird's eye perspective, end quote, in 1908. It wasn't long before his pigeon cam inspired the German military intelligence to do the same. It was, in fact, reported that the German army was training pigeons for photography in 1932, leading up to the Second World War. It is not difficult to imagine where such innovations have led us today. It is the United States that has the most comprehensive and aggressive drone program in the world today. They lead the world in drone technology. When American army strategists imagine what drones will be like in 25 years, they begin by getting an infographist to cre create a composite image of a typical Arab town complete with mosque, other buildings, and palm trees. Even though we see the images of another land, the objective of drone wars is no longer about territory, as was the colonial project, but rather how to eradicate a terrorist threat from a distance. The drone is the weapon of an amnesiac post-colonial violence. But it was Israel who had discovered the potential of RPVs, remotely piloted vehicles, after they had inherited a few machines scrapped by the Americans who momentarily had abandoned the, de de the development of their drone program in the 70s. In 1969, the Israeli Air Force was using drones to photograph and monitor Egyptian, Syrian, and Jordanian troops. And by 1973, in the Yom Kippur War, they sent out a wave of drones to mislead enemy defenses. The Egyptians used up all their art artillery and they were able to attack while Egyptians were reloading. It is no coincidence that this geographic region would see the first usage of remotely piloted vehicles. In 1869, W.F. Quimby of Wilmington, Delaware invented a new and improved flying machine. Quimby <clears throat> states in his application that his improvements intended to provide an arrangement of temporary sails resembling, in some respect, the wings of birds. Like him, many before Quinby attempted to acquire bird-like characteristics. 
In fact, the Bible itself has prompted many scholars and inventors to conceive of flying machines or bird-like machines inspired by the following passage from the book of Isaiah. Quote, as birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will pass over and preserve it, end quote. After taking up his command in Cairo in June 1917, Lord Allenby, the commander-in-chief of the Egyptian Expedition, Expeditionary Force, had been given explicit orders by the Prime Minister David Lloyd George to capture Jerusalem by Christmas. This was in the wake of two failed efforts by his predecessor, Sir Archibald Murray, to carry Gaza, a necessary condition for the conquest of Palestine from the Ottoman Turks. Lord Allenby was a believer in Bible prophecy. He was a religious man and did not want to destroy the holy places in the city of Jerusalem. Convinced by biblical scholars to move forward based on his biblical prophecy, Allenby ordered as many planes as possible to fly over Jerusalem. It is said that at that time, the Turks had never seen so many planes in the sky and were terrified by their presence. He ordered pilots to sell, send down leaflets commanding the Turks to surrender. The flyers read, surrender the city today, Allenby. Allenby in Arabic can only be written in one way, a nebi, which means prophet or son of God. What he did not know was that the Turks also believed in an old prophecy that they would never lose the holy city until a man of Allah came to deliver it. The Turks surrendered without firing a shot, an incredible fulfillment of biblical prophecy, which put Israel under British mandate. This mandate, called the Balfour Declaration, called for a Jewish homeland and set the foundation for modern Israel. Conscious of the city's special meaning for three of the world's great religions, in a deliberate act of humility and respect, Allenby entered Jerusalem on foot through the Jaffa Gate on December 11, 1917. He walked to the citadel from where he read a proclamation that made it clear he came not as a conqueror, but as a liberator. Of course, at this point, Allenby, Allenby becomes the man of the moment. All eyes were on him. But most peculiar, however, um, in, this, in his limelight, with the media focused on our new hero, is, is the emergence of a particular relationship with a bird. Lord Allenby had a pet marabou stork. Perhaps it was biblical fate that strengthened the bond with this bird. Perhaps the bird represents a sort of triumph, a symbolic embodiment of biblical prophecy. Perhaps it is not a coincidence. But it is this precise relationship that defines the absurdity of this story, the thread that unites the sequence of events. It relays the surreal way in which history is written or not written, the fantasies and the truths that we hold on to, the regime of truth and the power of narrative. So how does the story end? The spy bird in Inna was given the name Mina after an ancient Egyptian pharaoh who was credited with uniting Upper and Lower Egypt. Mina, in fact, means he who endures. However, the short-lived success story of getting Mina released was not enough to keep him safe until he exited Egypt. Upon release, he was almost instantly shot down and was consumed by the very people who had questioned him in the first place. They had consumed their paranoia. البلد اللي يشوفها من فوق غير اللي يشوفها من تحت <تصفيق> انو اخي اللي فوق ولا اللي تحت اللي عايز يشوفها حلو على طول يشوفها من فوق دايما اول مره تسكن في العالي <تصفيق> اول مره بس مش هتكون اخر مره تحت في خنقه 
زحمة وفقر وهوى فاسد والناس ماشية في الشوارع بتخبط في بعض احنا خلاص مش هنعيش تحت تاني هنعيش دايما فوق <تصفيق>